Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual corporate breakfast. My name is Sue Hunt, and it's my great privilege to be the Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation. Can I begin by acknowledging that we gather on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal people who are with us today. It's wonderful to see all of you online. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really think that uh, these corporate uh, opportunity, these uh, virtual opportunities for us all to get together has really been one of the great um, benefits of the last 12 months. So it's really fantastic that we can bring um, stories of impact and the hospital to you, even though we're still physically distanced. Uh, we'd love to hear from you today, so please use the chat function uh, to tell us your name and where you're from. We'll also be using live captioning, which you can view by cl clicking on the live transcript button in the menu bar below. The captions are uh, coming to you live, uh, so they're automatically generated, so they're not going to be perfect, but we do hope that they will help you um, in any case if you need them. This morning, it's my great pleasure to welcome our two presenters, um, Beth Dunn, who's the Manager of Child Life Therapy and Music Therapy Programs here at the hospital, and David Lee, Founding Director of K2LD, an international architecture and interior design firm and long-term supporter of the RCH Foundation. Thank you both so much for taking the time to join us today, and we're very, very much looking forward to hearing um, what you've both got to say. We do also have some uh, members of our Auxiliaries Executive Committee and the wonderful Parkville Auxiliary online. Um, and it's particularly fantastic that we can welcome uh, you ladies today because you've been very generous long-term supporters of music therapy. Um, and I know whenever we talk about it, um, Parkville and the committee um, uh, join in because they're very kind of keen to hear what the latest developments are. So uh, today we're very fortunate to have Beth talk with us about the way creative therapies are enhancing patient care at the hospital. Uh, Beth's been part of the music therapy program uh, at the hospital since the very beginning. She was appointed as the RCH's first music therapist in 1991, which makes this her 30th year working on the program, which is a truly incredible achievement. Today, the music therapy uh, team includes eight music therapists and provides more than 205 hours of services to patients every week. And significantly uh, and, and joyfully for us, uh, there's more than 75% of these hours are funded thanks to philanthropy and the support of people uh, like you. So before I um, hand over to Beth to tell us more, just wanted to take you through how to ask questions. So we're very keen to hear questions after today's presentation. Please type them in the chat function uh, and we will endeavour to answer all of them in our Q&A later on. So, um, handing over to Beth, delighted that you could be with us, Beth. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me, Sue, and, and everybody. And hello to my friends at the Parkville Auxiliary. I um, have spoken with you many times, so welcome. Um, you'll have seen some of um, the things I'm talking about today, but I will, I'm sure you won't mind seeing them again. I have the privilege of being the manager of Child Life Therapy, Music Therapy and the Garden Program, all really great programs, if I do say so myself. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly um, about each of these programs this morning. But first, I'd like to start off with a video of the Child Life Therapy Program. I'm just scared about them getting the anaesthetic wrong and then I feel the pain. Because it might hurt them, what the doctors are doing. They'll, they'll be scared of them to cut their tummy up and, and get the warm out. Well, some of the machines looked really scary because I had no idea what they were for. And when I went into the theatre to be operated on, there was it was full of machines and that's what got me really worried.
So the three of the programs um, that offer creative therapies in this hospital is Child Life Therapy, Music Therapy and the Garden Program. So the Child Life Therapy, Child Life Therapists, previously known as Educational Play Therapists, have a background in teaching and are trained on the job as Child Life Therapists. We have 17 child life therapists at RCH, about 12 full-time effective, um, and their job involves a lot of play. So while play in hospital often looks just like fun, child life therapists are constantly assessing children's responses and, uh, and assessing and attempting to incorporate activities that, while being fun, can introduce coping strategies and promote mastery and control over the situations that children find themselves in in hospital. So by allowing children the opportunity to explore medical equipment, become familiar with it um, and use it on dolls, um, they can actively participate in learning processes and um, better understand the information being presented to them. So through targeted play activities, children can actively in, in participate in the learning process, better understand the information being presented, become familiar with the procedures that they are undergoing, um, manipulate traumatic or anxiety-inducing situations in attempt to gain mastery. So um, play can also allow children um, safe expression um, in a, of emotions in a safe way and give an insight um, into what they may be experiencing. Channeling these emotions into appropriate activities can create an outlet and assist the child to regulate their behaviour. So, um, uh, for example, there was a five-year-old boy um, that one of the child life therapists worked with who was um, waiting to have surgery in, in the day surgery um, environment and he had autism um, and he was quite um, uh, uh, distressed and worried um, and anxious about um, the environment. And what the child life therapist did was provided him with a safe space to play, provided him with a ball that his mum said he loved playing with balls. And so at first the ball was thrown around with quite a lot of force, um, but over the course of a few minutes it became less aggressive and he started interacting with the child life therapist and involving the mother and the child life therapist and, and initiate, initiated a game. And so he then calmed down and was able to then wait for his day his surgery without becoming aggressive or um, absconding. Um, often for parents, seeing their child engage in a normal activity can also reduce their anxiety and minimise the transference of parental anxiety to the child as well because parents ex experience a lot of anxiety around hospital as well. And so child life therapists use play as um, a great um, way of, of helping children cope. Um, we have uh, some great um, resources that are available for everybody to use. So if you wanted to check out these um, videos, uh, we have um, a Be Positive and In-House uh, in TV show, um, which you can, there's a link there to the t hospital TV show and there are also lots of um, procedure guides that um, the show has produced over the years to help children and parents understand um, before they come to hospital the sorts of procedures that they're going to go through and uh, understanding what the child ex is going to experience can help before they come to hospital to, so, to help reduce that anxiety. We also have a great um, app called the Okia Medical Imaging app, which um, has some great games in it for children to play and learn about the various medical imaging um, experiences and procedures that they'll have when they come to hospital. So check those out. So now I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about music therapy. So I'll just, again, show you a video of music therapy. We were in hospital on the neurosurgery ward for about eight weeks. And at that time, David was very sick. Because of the stroke he had, unfortunately, lost his ability to walk and talk. He was confined to his bed and in his room. He was very fearful at that stage of adults because most of the time they would come in and they would do something that was particularly unpleasant to him. And it was during that time that we were first introduced to music therapy. The music 
music therapy allows children to normalize the clinical experience. It brings happiness, a sense of well-being to them, which relaxes them. It allows nurses to engage with children a lot easier. It makes assessments easier. During music therapy, children that have had surgical interventions are able to move and dance and sing, which aids in their physiotherapy. When children return back from music therapy, we notice that they eat more, they engage more with their parents. They're just overall more happy to be in the hospital. We run the music group on the cardiac ward to provide the children there with opportunities for developmental stimulation through music. And the beauty of music is that they're engaging in their other therapeutic goals without even knowing it. You slowly see them warm up and come out of their shell when they realise that it's a safe and secure environment for them to express themselves. Ivan had a brain injury which meant that um, he wasn't able to communicate using speech as functionally as before. And he was really passionate about music, so Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, the Collingwood Football Club theme song. And so he used this passion to help his speech rehabilitation. We also used musical speech stimulation, so left off the last word of phrases to get him to initiate more speech. For me, music therapy is about sharing music with somebody in a time of need. We work together as a team to address the various and often multiple needs of the children and patients that we see here to ensure that they're getting the best possible service. If a patient is particularly anxious or withdrawn or scared, doing physical movements for the first time after a surgery or after an accident can be painful and scary, so music can assist with reducing those perceptions of pain and anxiety to get them to participate in physiotherapy. Later. See you later, alligator. <laughs> One mum ran out of the room up and down the corridor <laughs> yelling to all of the nurses that her son had sung and it was the first sounds that he'd made. Watch you. <laughs> it's so important that families have access to the music therapy program because it really changed our life at a time where things were fairly dire. Music therapy allowed us to see tremendous gains in David's development, his emotional well-being and the well-being of our entire family. So as we said before, we have eight music therapists now at the Children's Hospital, starting with one in 1991. We've, we've now got eight, thanks to philanthropy. Um, and to become a music therapist in Australia, you must do a master's degree now at Melbourne University um, in music therapy. Um, music is universal and familiar to everybody. Um, think about your own experience of music, how it can change a mood, how it can create an atmosphere. Um, children respond well to music. It's something they know. It's something that's familiar to them. It's a normal experience. It's a fun experience. Um, it can be fun. Um, and they can participate in groups or, or bedside here at the hospital. Um, no matter how sick a child can participate in music. Um, for example, this, this child um, in PICU, in the, in the intensive care unit, um, she couldn't speak, she couldn't move, and yet we uh, arranged it so that she could um, 
manipulate the instruments sitting there on the side of the drum um, and we sang with her dad um, a few times a week and she just had the best time when a lot of other things going on in her life were quite um, frightening and anxiety prov- provoking. Um, she really looked forward to these sessions where she could actually do something. There were also children who um, are perhaps lying in bed and can't actually sit up or do anything but we can sing a quiet song and help them relax and perhaps put them um, off to sleep so that they can have a really much deeper relaxing sleep which is is really beneficial for health. Um, There are also children, as you can see in the pictures, for whom um, they have a lot of energy that needs um, expending. Um, Perhaps they are spending a lot of time in in hospital and we're very fortunate here to have a music room. Um, That middle shot of the boy with the drums is in our music room and um, he loved coming down for his once weekly um, bash on the drums where he could really let fly, make a lot of noise, but also um, it was part of his um, physical rehab so that he could um, start to get his body moving again after being um, in hospital for a long time. So um, music can match different uh, energy levels and abilities and it's a, it's a great um, creative um, therapy to have in the hospital. So now moving on to the garden program. So the garden program staff also have a teaching background combined with horticultural qualifications. It's a very part-time program. It's only two days per week at the hospital, but it provides a very unique program here in the hospital um, and there is no other program like it in Australia. We're very, very fortunate. And again, this is funded by philanthropy. There's a lot of benefits, lots of various benefits for the garden program, but there's the aesthetic benefits. So even the sickest patient can benefit from simply seeing or experiencing the natural environment, the the fresh air and the sunlight and and the plants, those beautiful flowers and, and, and those sorts of things. There's also the ability to being involved with something with they have a little bit more of more energy, you know, getting their hands dirty, planting plants that if they're regular um, visitors to the hospital, they can come back and, and note how much their rose that they planted last time has grown. Um, they can also help with weeding. Um, and then there's also the mosaics that they can work on, uh, perhaps build a plant pot or some tiles that they put on um, a section in the in the garden there. Um, it's a beautiful garden. So we're very fortunate to have the, all three programs um, in in the hospital here at RCH, um, offering really creative ways for children to cope and deal with their hospital experiences that are accessible and familiar to them. And we're very fortunate to have the philanthropy support. Um, so we're very thankful for the foundation's support for these three programs so thank you and thank you for having me. Thank you Beth thank you so much for such an interesting uh, presentation um, and thoughtful presentation. Uh, You'll have the opportunity to ask questions uh, a little bit later on folks so um, get those ready in the chat function. But before we do uh, move to a QA, and a it's my pleasure to introduce David Lee again to you who as I said was founding director of K2LD. David and his partner Tisha direct the Melbourne office uh, and they've been long-term, long-time supporters of the music therapy program at the hospital. So thank you so much for that long-term support, David. We're very grateful for your ongoing committed um, commitment and, and we know just how difficult that is uh, for everybody right now. So particularly to you, thank you so much for that. So I'm going to hand over and we'd, we'd just love to hear your story. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, uh, Royal Children and Royal Children Foundation, for the invitation to talk uh, this morning. The reason I'm here is to give you a little insight into my journey with Royal Children and some background behind why um, we chose to support this wonderful foundation. Our journey started back in the year 2000 when I was still residing in Singapore. At that time, um, we found a lump on Aaron's back when he was just 11 months old. He, um, uh, he had to take a surgery, um, and it was a, a massive surgery to remove the lump. Um, it was an experience, I guess, uh, that, um, that formed my view about what 
care is um, the act of taking blood tests and inserting a line in Aaron were really traumatic. Um, we found ourselves in this forced circumstance where surgery care was great, but general care had a lot to improve. After the surgery, we discovered that Aaron had neuroblastoma, um, a very rare form of cancer. Our world sank. We were overwhelmed by anxiety and fell into despair. Um, neuroblastoma only happens um, one uh, every year in, in the island of Singapore. We were desperately seeking for answers around the world and eventually found ourselves coming to Melbourne. It was here at RCH that we met Karen Tiedemann, who became Aaron's doctor. He was treated with love and kindness. Nurses were great. Um, they became friends. Uh, they became um, not just, you know, Aaron's friend, but it was mine too. Um, Aaron's visitation to the MRI uh, were like someone who had frequent fly miles. Uh, it was every three months that Karen wanted um, <coughs> and wanted um, Aaron to, to uh, have a look at what was going on in, in his back. Remember, we remember those times as the opportunity to meet a kind volunteer uh, who would help Aaron to do colouring and simply draw something with the textures. When I think about MRI experience, I feel numb. I think about the, the GA, the general anaesthetic that he has to go through. Um, but for Aaron, all he thinks about was the ice cream when he wakes up. <laughs> The time with Dr. Tiedemann uh, was precious to me, uh, a time to allow Aaron to be checked every three months, um, a time to just listen to um, what she has to say. Um, the season changed in every visit to the Royal Children, wet days, cold days, it didn't matter. Um, the, but, but what mattered was the people that uh, defined the place. So much so that Dr. Tiedemann's retirement uh, was a big blow to us, to me and to Aaron as well. Um, she was our constant. Um, she was like a rock. Aaron is now 21 years old. Uh, he received his discharge passport in 2016, um, 15 years later, um, and it was a very long time. Whilst we are so grateful for Aaron's discharge, we left with a feeling of sadness and a feeling of not wanting to depart uh, from this place that gave us hope, um, from the people that cared for my son and kept him alive. During this journey with Aaron, we looked for ways to contribute to the hospital, and that is how we met Beth more than a decade ago. Perhaps this was my way of staying connected with Royal Children's Hospital. The music therapy uh, reminded me of the many volunteers in the waiting lounge. Um, and Aaron, at that time, was pretty passionate about his music and his violin. When the art trail popped up, we thought it was a fantastic idea. I remember all those drawings that Aaron did in the waiting lounge brought back memories. It gave another meaningful opportunity to connect with our children. Aaron now is, fourth year, is, is in fourth year medical degree in Melbourne Uni. Karen must have inspired him, I'm not sure. Uh, he's healthy um, and fit and totally immersed in his young adult life. Most of all, we are so grateful he is alive. I hope this picture that I've painted has given you an insight of my journey a journey that started from Singapore that has given me a good contrast to see how blessed we are in Melbourne. We have the best children's hospital in the world with the kind support from government and you and the community. Aaron is one of, my, of the many children that uh, were beneficiary of the legacy of giving, giving in every sense, uh, time, money, volunteering. I am humbled, I am grateful, I am indebted to all of the many people that make this hospital what it is and for, the, for blessing our children in so many ways. Thank you.
Thank, David, thank you so very much. Um, extraordinary um, presentation, but extraordinary that you could share your family story with us. So thank you so very much. And um, and I guess what that makes me reflect on is um, the, the incredible example of where you, you had the worst of times and you've been at your most vulnerable, but you've been able to turn that by through the generosity that you felt gave meaning to that experience. You've been able to turn that into a positive experience for so many children who've come afterwards. Um, and I know that you know, the children and the families have benefited extraordinarily from that. And I know that Beth you know, amongst others, is incredibly grateful for how you gave meaning to that experience and your desire to, you know, to, to give back. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's your opportunity to ask questions from, uh, of Beth and David. Um, so once again, please type them in the, in the chat function. I'm going to, to kick us off, but actually one thing that I've just um, wanted to say, just in terms of uh, adding to uh, David's story, um, we've also got uh, on the call this morning Jeff Darmanin, who is the Executive Director, CEO of the Children's Cancer Foundation. Uh, and the CCF, as, as we uh, know it, has been such incredible supporters of uh, the creative therapies here at the hospital, particularly in, in, um, in our oncology wards, that I just wanted to call out Jeff thank you so much also to you um, and the foundation for its ongoing support of um, of child life in general and music therapy um, in particular so I think that's just another connection that brings um, brings the story uh, to light so um, while we're waiting for some questions I'm going to kick off so Beth I'm going to ask you first Beth you've been with us as I said before for over 30 years for the entire length of the the program um, it's an incredible achievement to not only be with an organisation for that long, but to be in you know one particular area, which is the creative therapies. How have you seen that change over time? I think um, over the years um, that the hospital embra has embraced it, uh, and I think they embraced it to start with, and I think they just continue to embrace it. I think the building of the new hospital just shows how much mm. they're committed to um, the 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 coping experiences of the children, not just their medical care, mm, but mm. the whole total care of the patient is really important. Um, and I think just the fact that they have supported the increase um, of the, the child life therapy and music therapy programs to continue to grow um, has been fantastic. So I think, yeah, I think that that's, that's how I've seen it change, just more and more um, support for, yeah. for the creative therapy. Piece. Yeah, mm. and the an acknowledgement that they actually play a, a um, important part in the, yes. the recovery. Yeah, mm. and I think, you, as you say, you can see it in in the th in the program. You can also see it in how the building itself was thought of and yeah. constructed with the the art that surrounds us, um, and with the you know the distraction opportunities that are there, whether mm. it's the meerkats or the mm. or the aquarium yeah. or you know. So we've got art surrounding us because. You know, we saw the evidence base for, mm. you know, for growth in, you know, for how art can help healing. Yeah. Um, and I think, as you say, the program itself demonstrates that whether in any one of those ones that you've talked mm. about demonstrates that, doesn't it, every time yeah. that it helps it helps healing. Mm. So it's a distraction on the one hand, but it helps it helps the experience and often can absolutely help the healing. So, yeah, yeah. so I think it's um, you're right. That would be my experience of watching that mm. growth over the short time much shorter time that I've mm. been here is is just um, that that evidence base came in and people were able to say right let's yep. let's go um, and I think pro probably in the early years there was much more of an intuitive feeling about I think you know, about so. how creative therapies would make a difference yeah I think mm. so in the early years I think it was they that we introduced it and, and people could see that it was making a difference mm. and so it, then it became a lot more evidence-based. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. So um, the lovely follow-up here that's uh, that I've got. So tell us about how creative therapies help parents go through the process. 
I think by seeing their child um, experience um, some normal experiences Mm. and and I think what we see and what the parents see is that healthy child that's underneath the sick external. They can see a child maybe smile for the Mm. first time when they sing a song or participate in something that they haven't been able to participate in for a while and they can see that that, um, the child they know And so that helps the the parent um, feel less anxious about Mm. um, the the process and the experience of their child. Yeah. 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 David, do you want to add anything Uh, there? Yeah, I thought thought that if... I mean, I'm trying to project myself if Beth was around um, when I was going through the lounges, Mm. the frequent flyers of lounging. (laughs) Yes. I think if there was music therapy in the lounge at that time, um, there was it. There was an there's an ability for to create memories, mm. and I think those memories are what I hang on to. So I didn't have music, but I had art, mm. and um, the art was not just about drawing a piece of drawing to 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 kind of uh, kill time and wait for that that time to come. Um, but it was a connection between the volunteer and us, me or Aaron, um, and it it gave another layer of memories. I think, mm. whether it's good or bad, I think it it w- it was a it was something that it it, it was like normalising instead of a memory in the schoolyard or in the yard. Uh. It, it was a memory in in the hospital, and yeah. it's not not necessarily bad as well. Yeah. Thank you. That's really that's a great reflection. Um, so, how does the scale of your? Um, um, there's got some lovely questions coming through about the program, David. So I'm going to keep on those, but I yep. do have one for you in a minute. Um, tell us about how the scale of your programs, Beth, compare with children's hospitals nationally and uh, around the world. Um, okay, so f- music therapy. Um, we are the largest paediatric um, music therapy program in Australia. Um, we probably compare. Um, fairly well with with programs in America. Um, child life therapy is there's also child life therapists in Monash and Sydney Children's. Um, I I'm not exactly sure of the the. I think we are also the largest child life therapy program in Australia, but we have half the number of child life therapists here that they do an equivalent hospital in America. It's a very big mm. um, program in America. Mm. Um, so, we, you know, we've got, what did I say, 17 here in uh, an equivalent hospital, say Seattle, for example, they've got 31. Mm. So yeah. well, it's a much smaller program here. Mm. Um, but we're, we're fairly large in terms of the other hospitals in Australia. Yeah. So I guess there's a follow-up question, not a follow-up, it just builds on that thinking. We might not be the largest in the world, but tell us where we fit in the, in the kind of notion of centres of excellence in the thera- you know, in the, in the, where do we sit in that kind of, you know, um, impact? Well, I think in music therapy we're very much um, one of the leaders in yeah. in that field. Um, in child life therapy, we're very much equivalent. Mm-hmm. I think some of the things that we offer in child life therapy are unique. So we have a mock MRI program, which is very uh, unique. Um, that that was um, created specifically for this hospital and I'm not sure how many of those are actually in, ex- in existence in the world so I think that's mm. very unique yeah. to this hospital. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so, and then, uh, so you know, this is a really interesting question um, and I particularly think this is related to the Children's Cancer Centre um, Specifically, can you speak to the assessment of children's needs to participate in the program? So we understand it's considered considered part of care now. What are the doctors looking for the programs to achieve along with the other treatments? So where does it fit? Yeah, mm. OK. <clears throat> well, I think um, specifically for the cancer centre. Um, uh, that's how the question was yeah, written, okay. but, but I think, you know, in general terms, yeah. yeah. Well, I think we we assess things because we we do have um, a much larger demand than we have capacity. Mm-hmm. So we're constantly assessing to see um, that the the most neediest 
needy patients get the our priority service and so those patients would be those patients perhaps who are more isolated you know, perhaps um, experiencing a bone marrow transplant for example and have to be in isolation so have very little um, or reduced stimulation opportunities and so uh, and normal opportunities so that they're one of our priorities um, the sickest patients who perhaps can't participate in any other activities um, they can't see up and, and participate in um, craft activities, all those sorts of things, So, but they can participate in music. So they would be, um, a, again, a priority. Um, child life therapists uh, prioritise patients who um, perhaps have additional needs and need some support to um, cope with their procedures and so they perhaps need a lot more um, intense uh, preparation for procedures, perhaps with social stories or board maker um, uh, instructions for, for their procedures. Um, so it's it's an assessment based on the need of the child at the time, mm. I think. Is, is, is that Yeah, no, I think that, that's... Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, the other thing we'll ask you to do perhaps is just talk a little bit more about the mock MRI because people may not, mm. you know, understand quite what that means. So tell us a little bit about that. And, David, you may like to reflect on how that might have made, uh, you know, your journey a little different too. Um, the mock MRI program's a great program. So we have in this hospital an MRI machine a mock MRI machine so it doesn't have um, the magnets in it um, that the, the normal MRI has but it looks like an MRI machine um, it has the sounds of an MRI machine and so what happens in the, the room next to it the children go through the um, and the child life therapist goes through what's going to happen for them in the MRI with a little doll and a little um, wooden um, structure and it's explained to them what the process is and they get to play with it then they go into the mock MRI machine room and they get to hop on the the um, the, the bed and get to play um, and what happens is that the child life therapist assesses whether the child is able to sit still to lie still and if the child can lie still then they go on to have a real MRI without a GA without a general anesthetic if the child is not able to to sit still then they would be um, assessed as needing to have a general anesthetic and so it saves um, the hospital in that they don't have to have a lot of children on the wait list for for a general anaesthetic, um, they can go straight through and have um, an MRI awake. So uh, I think we we do about, I, I think it's about 900 of those a year. Wow. Oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah. wow that's, that, that really makes a number zing, yeah. doesn't it? So, yeah, so David, you've heard, you know, that explained. Oh. I'm sure you imagined it already. <laughs> what might that have done for Aaron and your experience? Oh, I... Oh, I don't know. I, I I assume at the later years it would have been easier for him. Mm. Um, the mock ones, I think. Um, I think he was, he did once. I think at at his later years, but the early years would have been challenging. Yeah. He was too young, and he was too squirmish. <laughs> um, but what I uh, what I took away from my experience was, I think, um, the ability to get hit getting to get him comfortable and relax before the whole process starts and the clarity for him to see it i think would have been um would have been good for mm. him you know that there is a process i don't know whether you guys know but mm. you know he, he comes in he gets checked in does all the things that he needs to do in terms of weighing and all that but then um there's a process of um numbing his hands mm. uh, with a with a with a tachydem, um and getting him ready for that insertion of that line um yeah. after a few times he kind of figured that out out and then he refuses to let that happen <laughs> um and i think then that there was this um process of a step um one step earlier which is to calm him down so he, he drinks this liquid to calm him to calms him down before before the numbing of the hands so um there there you know it it, it wasn't the same as what Beth has described no. it. and i think if 
if it was around now, I think it would be a, a much more comfortable process, process. both for the parents and, and child yeah. as well. Yeah, great. So. Thank you. Um, so um, just to change it up a little bit and to take it out from the program entirely, David, um, I'm really interested in, you know, the connection that you see between your career and, you know, as an architect and so on, and the role of creativity. So talk us about that sense of creativity and creative industries um, and how they kind of sit together for you. Uh, what, what we do uh, at work is all uh, to do with um, creating objects that sits comfortably on a piece of land and... Um, there's a lot of respect for the land, mm. for the um, for the for the uh, the brief uh, on the land, um, and you each of us um, architects in Melbourne, we tend to um, work with um, the brief, um, but I think what's interesting for me is. Um, how we see this land um, manifest itself in the design. I think that, for me, in the creative field, um, it's it's informed by a lot more than just the 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 conscious. It is all the subconscious. Mm. Um, I think. Um, Creativity uh, is um, is challenging at most times, um, but I also feel that creativity becomes um, more interesting when there is a lot of uh, other factors that's that's in play. So the land, the brief, mm. and uh, the person itself as well, the inner self, where uh, whether you're going through a, uh, a happy phase of your life or mm. a sad phase of your life. Uh, so f for me, um, the creative part of things, uh, the fun parts of all things are about trying to knit all these little things together to make an, uh, an ultimate uh, completion of a mm. project or design of a project. Um, for me, it's also to do with the journey. Uh, the, from, at the end, it's not the, the outcome for me. Mm. Uh, for me, it's the journey. The, and it, um, I don't know whether it's true. My career, um, my career is, is filled with uh, quite interesting uh, events, uh, personally and professionally. Mm. And I don't look at the the end. I don't look at the outcome at the end. I look, I, I look at the journey that I have influenced um, and also I look at um, the people that I have uh, participate with in that journey. Mm. Um, so f for me, uh, at the end, um, the creative part is... Um, not really the the biggest significant thing. Uh, it's it's about the relationship and the people around me that has uh, gone through this journey with me. Mm. Kind okay. of similar to my son. For me, my yeah. you know, it's I'm glad that my son is alive. Um, but um, often my uh, compass goes back to my journey with my son. Mm. Mm. And I guess thank you so much for for all of that. And the first thing I'd say is that so the, there's that journey that across the water as well to come here. So there's the yes. there was there was the journey for for you and your son, but you've had to come to a different 
a different yeah. country to, to have that journey yeah. um, and a different environment. And, and as you said before, when we were off air, you said, you know, this hospital isn't the hospital that you experienced because, you, you know, your experience was um, the first hospital on this site. But just hearing you reflect on creativity and the role of architecture in creativity has just made me, you know, really reflect on also what what happened here to when we were creating this hospital and I you know I was my journey with this hospital started about 12 months before the new hospital but the architects here created and wanted to create they for them land was really important so you talked about land land was really important sense of place was important being on this site was important from the early 60s, of course, and, and then so we've stayed there. Then they created, off the land, they created hospital in the park, park in the hospital. And then they created this sense of, then they wanted to create this sense of village. And so we, we have a main street and we have, you know, buildings collected around main street. Um, and then that, that sense of, you know, this is a small country town. So once again, place. And then they layered... Um, art and creativity on the top of that with our mobiles, with our creature, you know, so they, and with, you know, the, the placemaking around the signage and so forth, they, they brought all of that. That all came off, as you were saying, that sense of place and land in the, in the first place mm -hmm. um, and the creativity that came with it. And I guess the final, you know, the other thing that I was just thinking as you were talking, that the, the main architect of this said you know, in early speeches when, when the place, when the hospital opened was when he started on the project, he had no children. And by the time he finished, I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong here, but he could have had as many as four children. He certainly had a number of children by the time he finished um, that project. So um, I just thank you for sharing that because it, that, that made me relive all of those things about, you know, the experience of creating this place uh, which is a healing environment, and which you know, once again, bring it back to um, bring it back to philanthropy and back to to making meaning out of the experience that people have. You know, it all it, it kind of knits together with what we're talking about today around uh, you know around creativity. So, mm. thank you for that. And um, you know, as we turn the as we turn the ghost lights off in our theatres, and we bring you know theatre practitioners and dancers uh, and uh, music people back to our city and our in our world because we're lucky enough in this pandemic to be able to do that. Um, it's not just those practitioners who are our creative industries, but architects as well um, all form part of that. So we're incredibly lucky, aren't we? Um, I wanted to ask you, I think we're okay for time, I want to ask you one other question, David, you know, kick it up again. Um, how important supporting you know, a, a cause, a not-for-profit cause, but how, how important is supporting it to the company itself and, and what difference does that impact and make to, to your team when you support? Um, yeah, it, it is very important. I mean, giving back is really important for, for, for us as a company. Um, it, I, I, I believe the staff really enjoys um, and see purpose. Um, you know, these days, people um, want to um, celebrate their career in a meaningful way. Mm. Um, and we've, we've been blessed with a lot of public work and the government's been good to us as private enterprise. And it's our way of you know giving back as well and i think the staff knows that it we we you know it, it kind of works both ways um the government feeds us keeps us alive keeps us off the streets and we we give it back mm. to good cause mm. and meaningful cause at the end the career um it's one thing but when you're at the end of your career, you you want to be able to say that you one has been you know able to do something beyond just selfish um, oneself needs. Uh, we can we could say that we have contributed something to the Royal Children's Hospital. I think that's a, a lot more meaningful mm. because it touches so many families. Thank you. Thank you. That's, um, thank you so much. Um, 
Beth, we have one more question that I've got typed here before me and then I'm going to ask you my final you know, question, which I'm allowed to do as CEO of the Foundation. Um, so I think also from the Children's Cancer Centre, when's the next art therapy exhibition? Oh, well, I actually don't manage the art therapy program, so I don't actually have the answer to that question. Art therapy is managed by the Children's Cancer Centre mm. themselves, so I'm sorry I can't okay. answer that question. Right. Sorry. Well, whoever's <laughs> asked that question, if it wasn't the centre, just I'm just reading straight off the iPad here. We'll need to do some. We'll need to do some more reference mm. points to get that. Um, okay. So, uh, how's our time? Yes, I'm going to ask the last question. Okay. Don't look so scared. <laughs> It's all terrific. Um, I love asking this question, okay. though. Um, and uh, just imagine for a minute that someone gave you a million dollars tomorrow. How would you evolve? Yes, I know. <laughs> We'd love that too. Um, how would you evolve the program here at the hospital? I would just put more child life therapists and music therapists on. Mm. Um, I think our demand, the demand for our services has gone through the roof. I mean, we were very fortunate last year during COVID time um, that we were considered essential workers. So we still were able to come to the mm. hospital. And when there were limited visitors, no volunteers, no clown doctors, no starlight captains, nothing, wow, okay. there was very little for the children in the hospital but music, art and garden. So it was great that um, we were able to continue to provide those services but they were in high demand um, and what we found was that um, the demand grew for the really high-end needs so there was a lot of this level that completely missed out and we were seeing just the really um, high priority children mm. and so I think if I had a million dollars I'd spend it on being able to provide play and music experiences for um, everybody. Mm. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, everyone, for your really well-considered questions. Um, and thank you so much to Beth and David uh, for such interesting um, presentations. So you might imagine we're currently supporting, uh, seeking support for the music therapy program on the Kelpie Ward, which is caring for adolescents at the hospital. Uh, and they work really closely with our oncology and our rehabilitation teams to support sick children and their families. So if you're interested in supporting um, the program for, uh, for any period of time, but, um, we'd, but particularly for, for the first year, uh, please do get in touch with Kate, who would be delighted to speak with you. So, look, as you've seen this morning, it, uh, it makes such a remarkable difference to the way children in our hospital respond to treatment and care. So we are um, we're really dedicated and interested to keep growing the program if that's a priority for the hospital. And we know that this um, work in Kelpie Ward is really a priority right now. So please, if you, if you can support us, we would love to hear that. Uh, hear from you. Um, but there are of course many other ways that you can get uh, involved with the hospital this year. We're, we're marking 150 years of service of the Royal Children's Hospital um, and whilst we were going to celebrate that fairly and squarely in 2020 because that marked the true 150 years, of course um, COVID had other ideas. So, um, But this year we are putting the, f the finishing touches to our celebration because we felt it was such an important um, milestone um, that 150 years of caring for our community that we really wanted to to make our mark with it. So you may have seen um, many of our UUs dotted around Melbourne and Geelong. Uh, David talked about the Art Trail before and K2LD, we were thrilled to say, were, uh, were sponsors of um, one of the UU statues. They're a really magical creature. They, it was conceived and designed by Alexander Knox, who designed Creature, uh, and they form me and UU the RCH 150 Anniversary Art Trail. And it's actually all about um, showcasing our state's artistic flair, um, engaging our community and celebrating that 150 years. And we've been really thrilled to be able to do it uh, in the last, you know, since since early January. Uh, so there's a hundred of those sculptures. Uh, they're dotted around, as I say, Melbourne. They've each one of them been individually designed by an Australian artist, and they've been generously um, sponsored. They found their ways into laneways, into streets, into parks, into waterfronts, public spaces. The one I, I sponsored is at the MCG, which I think is fantastic with my mad interest in sport as well. Uh, so you're able to walk the trail right now uh, for several weeks more. You're able to see them in Geelong. We did move them to an internal location in Geelong. So they're at um, the Federal Mills in, in, uh, in North Geelong. So you can see all 10 of them together there, which is a pretty great way to spend a, a day trip to Geelong.
Well, so we're so fortunate to have some of our 150 supporters with us this morning and I'd just like to take the opportunity for thanking all of you very much for your support again. And David, we're, we're thrilled that you supported one of our UUs as well. So if you haven't already got out and enjoy it, please do um, enjoy the art trail. It's going to culminate in an auction uh, in late April where every one of these magnificent sculptures will go under the hammer to raise funds for the hospital. They're also available uh, for that you can, if you are so passionate about one of them that you see and fall in love with it and must have it for home, uh, they're available to secure prior to the auction uh, and they're selling fast, which is really fantastic. We've got lots of people who have decided to create uh, gardens around them, to bring them into their home. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary how it's touched the hearts of people and just another way that people can support the hospital. Once again, Kate would be very happy to speak to you if you uh, do want to uh, do see one that you fall in love with. So thank you again so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, this brings us to the, uh, to the end of our virtual breakfast this morning. Thank you to Beth. Thank you to David again for taking the time out to have the conversation. I really enjoyed the conversation and hearing both about the program, but, but David, your family's extraordinary story. Thank you for sharing that with us. So to finish off today's events, ladies and gentlemen, we're delighted to share a video about the art trail. It features just one of our UUs, Tammy's Donor by artist Jazz Pop Creations. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Tammy uh, and the artist, um, who, uh, Tammy who inspired the UU and Jazz Pop who, who painted. Um, Tammy is the artist's cousin and inspired the design through her experience living with cystic fibrosis and featuring uh, and receiving a, a lung transplant at the hospital and it was my great honour to meet them and talk with them about how that worked for them. So thank you again everybody. Um, we won't, this will be the end of it, you'll see the video uh, and then uh, the link will, will close. Thank you again for all your support of the hospital, uh, for being part of our foundation family. Uh, it's a great honour, thank you. My name is Justine, my artist name Jazz Pop, and my UU's name is Tammy's Donor, named after my cousin's donor. Um, so my UU is dedicated to my cousin who has cystic fibrosis, and she was able to get a lung transplant a few years ago, so this UU is dedicated to her donor, and the family believes that her spirit lives through the dragonfly, so we've done like theme around the dragonfly and I've incorporated roses into it because cystic fibrosis is also known as 65 roses. I think I'll be really proud to see this out in the public because it's not just for my cousin but for everyone that has cystic fibrosis and everyone's families that are affected by it. While I work on my UU it's really made me think about how far my cousin's got, um, come from when she wasn't doing so well and just how much she's grown into such a beautiful person and it's all thanks to this donor. Working on my UUs just made me reflect how, how far my cousin Tammy's come um, and the life she's been able to build for herself because of her donor.